Hello, welcome back to my bookshelf. Please do subscribe if you haven't already. This is part of a series on Jacobitism. My goal here is to tease out Mencius Moldbug's references to the Stuart monarchy in his blog. In this episode, we meet the future James II, whose name in Latin, Jacobus, gives us Jacobite. The year was 1659, and after 10 very strange years in power, Parliament had a problem. Their forces had triumphed during the English Civil War of 1642-49, to overridden the monarchy, and executed Charles I. And the Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell had headed up an exacting Puritan regime which sought to interfere with the daily life of the people, seeing their role as the suppression of vice and promotion of virtue, but along specifically pro extremist Protestant lines. They shuttered the theaters made famous by William Shakespeare and Ben Jonson. They closed down huge numbers of taverns, especially those with royalist names like the Crown. They cracked down on gambling and outlawed beloved customs, such as maypole dancing, which they denounced as heathenish vanity, together with Christmas festivities. Government officials police dress and generally micromanage behavior. Much of the populace chafed against their rule and perceived a country without a king as unnatural. As G.K. Chesterton wrote, quote, England was never so little of a democracy as during the short time when it was a republic, unquote. When Oliver Cromwell died in 1658, his son Richard succeeded him as Lord Protector. But as Richard did not possess his father's imposing character, he lost the support of the army. Without a compelling sovereign to rally round, the country, not yet recovered from the civil war that had splintered it, looked set to fall into chaos. Uprisings were frequent, and now Parliament were too widely despised to govern effectively. As a result, members of the elite opened negotiations with the exiled Stuart King, Charles II, who was living in the Netherlands in a somewhat tattered state with his family and loyal courtiers. Among the parliamentary delegation which sailed from England was a civil servant, who became England's most celebrated diarist, Samuel Pepys. What can Pepys's diary tell us about the reinstallation of the Stuart monarchy in 1660? The diary depicts a dramatic political realignment. Pepys had gone to Holland with his patron, Sir Edward Montague. Pepys learned from Sir Edward in April 1660 that, quote, it was certain that the king of necessity must come in, unquote. Montague had originally been a su devoted supporter of Cromwell and had even tried pressuring him to accept the crown at one point. But once... Oliver Cromwell died and his son Richard fell after eight short months, Montague lost confidence in the protectorate's ability to govern and switched his allegiance to Charles II. One of the chief architects of the Restoration, Montague was made Earl of Sandwich for his efforts. Like his patron, Samuel Pepys had been a roundhead. As a young boy, he had witnessed the execution of the king, Charles I, with satisfaction a fact which he saved for his diary, understandably keeping it firmly to himself when he first came to kiss the hands of Charles II and his brother James, the Duke of York. He would go on to work closely with James in particular. The irony of the situation would haunt Pepys in the years to come. The tide had well and truly changed. Pepys writes of a certain royalist dinner companions that, quote, all their discourse and others are of the king's coming, and we begin to speak of it very freely, and heard how many churches in London, and upon how many signs, signs there, and upon merchant ships in the river, they had set up the king's arms, unquote. At another point, Pepys records that in the, that extraordinary spring, people were, quote, very merry, setting up the king's flag upon their maypoles, and drinking his health upon their knees in the streets, unquote. This type of thing would, of course, infuriated the increasingly powerless Puritans. 
but hopes were high that the sovereign would help to heal old divisions. The document that emerged from the negotiation, the Declaration of Breda, was read aloud in Parliament. It included assurances of a free and general pardon for his father's enemies. Apart from the actual regicides, those who had signed the king's death warrant, very few would be punished for having opposed the monarchy in the English Civil War. The matter of plundered and otherwise appropriated royal and royalist property would be left to Parliament to sort out. The Declaration of Breda also guaranteed religious freedom, except where it, quote, disturbed the peace of the kingdom, unquote. What the king required most going forward was loyalty. He was prepared to put the past behind him in exchange for that. A resolution was passed restoring government by king, lords, and commons, and parliament put an end to their 11-year experiment and invited Charles II home. It was by far the most popular policy they had ever enacted. Parliament got a sovereign, and the sovereign had his purse replenished, among other things. The poet Andrew Marvel, another one-time Cromwell supporter, conveys the sense of mutual benefit in this verse. Quote, At length, by wonderful impulse of fate, the people call him back to help the state. And what is more, they send him money too, and clothe him all head to foot anew. After so many years in the wilderness, the refurbished Charles returned in triumph at the age of 30. Huge ecstatic crowds greeted him at Dover, and the road to London thronged with cheering well-wishers. People were now fully at liberty to manifest their love for the king. Quote, the shouting and the joy expressed is past all imagination, wrote Pepys. All the world in a merry mood because of the king's coming. Unquote. In a May, unlike any other, huge maypoles were erected all over the capital, at every crossway, according to the biographer John Aubrey. Maypoles now symbolized restoration as much as renewal. Pepys records the myriad ways in which people now signaled their loyalty to the Stuarts, by drinking alcohol in lavish amounts, for example. Just like during the Civil War, one imbibed and made merry in order to prove one wasn't a roundhead. Manners were one means and fashion another. St Stuart's style took its cues from the rich court of Louis XIV. The most fashionable men wore long curly wigs, and both sexes favored black patches, an item which had been banned under Cromwell as an aristocratic affectation. These exaggerated beauty spots were made of silk taffeta or velvet and glued to the face to emphasize the whiteness of the skin. The patches, which had the ad added advantage of hiding smallpox scars, might appear in the form of crescents, diamonds, hearts, or stars. They were used as an erotic code. Pepys found them decidedly alluring. He records finding his wife Elizabeth wearing two or three black patches, and declares her to be even more fetching than the king's sisters, princesses Mary and Henrietta. The point of restoration manners was their sharp contrast with Puritan ones. A cavalier parliament was elected, and cavalier insouciance, self-indulgence, and irreverence were the order of the day. The culture was now in the hands of men and women who had suffered considerably first at the hands of the parliamentarian new model army during the war, and then at those of the protectorate administrators who had punished them for their royalism. Some had been exiled. They had faced bitter mil military defeat, and then the unthinkable, the execution of their king. And so the emphatic libertinism of restoration rakes should be apprehended in this light. They were determined to insult the Puritans whom they viewed as murderers of the anointed king in every way possible. It was offensive, and that is the point. There was more than a whiff of frustration in all this. Direct retribution was restricted, as promised by Charles, 
to the actual regicides and a few others directly responsible. But their fate was terrible. Of the 59 men who had signed the king's death warrant in 1649, 35 were still alive in 1660. A few escaped the country. Many were executed as traitors, hanged, drawn, and quartered. At times like this, Pepys could not help but nervously remember his own roundhead days. Upon witnessing the execution of the first regicide, he wrote, quote, Thus it was my fate to see the beheading of the king at Whitehall and to see the first blood shed in revenge for the blood of the king at Charing Cross, unquote. And there was no rest for the dead. Pepys reports queasily that, quote, Parliament has voted that the bodies of Oliver, Bradshaw, Ireton, and Bride should be taken up out of their graves and drawn to the gallows, and there hanged and reburied under it, which, methinks, do trouble me that a man of so great courage as he was, meaning Cromwell, should have that dishonor, though otherwise he might deserve it well enough." Unquote. Some Puritans learned to adapt to the Restoration, while others departed for the American colonies, where they sowed the seeds of the American Revolution some century later. One particularly extreme sect, in an age of extreme sects, undeterred by the prospect of a gory execution, took up arms in a wild attempt to overturn Charles II. These were the Fifth Monarchy Men, millenarians who took their name from a passage in the Second Book of Daniel. In it, King Nebuchadnezzar dreams of five empires, interpreted by the sect as Babylonian, Persian, Greek, Roman, and theirs. Quote, In the period of those kings, the God of heaven shall establish a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That kingdom shall never pass to another people. Unquote. The sect proclaimed that the fifth and final monarchy would commence in the year 1666. In that year, Jesus Christ would return to reign for 1,000 years with the fifth monarchists at his side. It was their role to usher in the ultimate empire. Fifth monarchists were men of influence. Two of them had been judges at Charles I's trial, and both had signed the king's death warrant so they had little to lose at this point. Initially, the sect had supported Oliver Cromwell. Later, they attempted to overthrow him for being insufficiently puritanical. Horrified by the Stuart Restoration and persuaded of their own invulnerability by their leaders, the Fifth Monarchists rose up, terrorizing London for several days in January 1661 in a chaotic effort to seize power. Pepys writes, for example, quote, This morning, news was brought to me at my bedside that there had been a great stir in the city this night by the fanatics, who had been up and killed six or seven men. And later, there are great fears of the fanatics rising again, unquote. Another diarist, Rugg, speaks of the sect disturbing the peace and liberty of the people and reports that, quote, my aunt is afraid to be on her own, unquote. Soon enough, however, the fifth monarchists had a date with the executioner. On January 31st, 1661, Pepys writes of being glad that the trouble is over. London streets were peaceful again. Pepys writes of a life lived in pubs, uh, a new invention called a coffee house, and the newly reopened theatres. Theatre going was another way one broadcasted one's embrace of the Restoration. Charles II sponsored a troop called the King's Company. His brother James, the Duke of York, sponsored the Duke's Company. A friendly rivalry rapidly developed. The new regulations specified that women would be able to play female parts for the first time professionally, as the Stuarts had seen them do in France. Female courtiers and members of the royal family had long appeared in masks, an art form which formed part of uh, royal pageantry. Essentially, the customs governing the mask came to be extended to professional theater, a fact which further underscored its association with monarchy. Following his patron, now Earl of Sandwich, 
Pepys went to work at the Admiralty under the Duke of York. This was, of course, a crucial role in an island nation gaining ever more colonies. James was a seasoned warrior. He had been appointed Lord at High Admiral at the age of three. At nine, he commanded a group of volunteers in the Royalist stronghold of Oxford. After his father lost the Civil War, he had been forced, age 15, to flee to England disguised as a woman. As exiles in France, James and Charles had earned their keep fighting alongside Louis XIV's forces on various expeditions. Now, thanks to the Restoration, James was able to fulfill his designated role, overseeing the day-to-day -day running of the Navy at a time when England's empire was growing, especially among North America's eastern seaboard. Some new territory won from the Dutch was renamed New York in the Duke's honour. Over the years, Samuel Pepys would become ever more closely affiliated with James, despite his misgivings about the Duke's affinity for Catholics. Although the Duke of York was second in line to the throne, no one really thought then that he would become king because Charles was expected to marry and produce heirs. Still, people played close attention to his prospects. Pepys's account of the Duke's affair with Anne Hyde sounds like the plot of a saucy restoration comedy. James had met Anne while in exile in Holland. A daughter of the politically influential Duke of Clarendon, she was nonetheless a commoner and thus rather unsuitable as a wife. Before taking her to bed, James had apparently written out a promise to marry her and signed it in his own blood. Later, once she had got pregnant, he broke into her rooms and stole the document. Eventually, however, James did honour his promise, wedding Anne in September 1660. Pepys records that this marriage pleased no one in particular, except Anne, presumably. She gave him two children, Mary and Anne. James, for his part, turned out to be an extremely devoted father, a fact which would produce unexpected consequences down the road. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to any comments below. And see you next time.